So thank you um, to the Floss Department and Patrick and everyone for coming today. I want to say a bit about what this project is, because it's actually kind of a strange project in some ways for a philosophy talk. Um, and then I'll do the paper. I'm mostly going to read the paper, but not entirely. It's definitely a work in progress, and there are some parts that aren't really written yet, and it'll be pretty obvious when I start talking instead of reading. Um, so any feedback that you have, I really appreciate. One of the things that I've noticed about this topic of self-deprecation, like most topics, is the more you start thinking about it, the bigger and more complicated it gets. Um, so that's good. It makes it harder to constrain it in ways. So this. Um, this topic came out of this ongoing interest, which is also what motivated that book in on manners. I'm really interested in social conventions, just in themselves, and also about the relationship between social conventions and morality. Because it strikes me just intuitively that there are some social conventions with which mor where morality seems to be pretty much irrelevant. But there are plenty of social conventions in which it seems that morality has something to say in the matter about whether or not we follow them. And there are some social conventions, I think, that have moral force behind them. There's moral reason to abide by them. And there are some social conventions that there's moral reason not to abide by. Um, and I think that's interesting. And so uh, there's a sort of bigger intellectual project that interests me about the relationship between social conventions and moral, conven moral norms and whether or not there's a difference in the domains of manners and the domains of morality. I don't actually think there is a sharp dividing line, but that's not terribly important, I think, to my talk, except that what interests me about self-deprecation, this practice of self-deprecation, um, is that this strikes me as one of these social conventions, so there are these norms of self-deprecation. And I think this is a case where there are sometimes moral reasons supporting self-deprecation and sometimes moral reasons opposing self-deprecation. And my interest in this topic is trying to figure out whether there's something that unites those two intuitions, whether there's some sort of ethical account, moral account of what self-deprecation is doing that can explain why this is so. Um, the second part of this is this paper is going to use a lot of Kant. So let me just say something about my relationship with Kant. Um, I often say that I'm, a, um, I'm an Aristotelian who plays a Kantian on television, except not on television. Um, so I think of myself, and I certainly started out as being an Aristotelian virtue ethicist, and I really still am in many ways, except what's happened is that I find myself getting drawn deep. Basically, the more Kant I read, the more deeply I seem to get drawn into Kantian ethics. And I'm particularly interested in um, the relationship between Kant's empirical psychology and his ethics. Because as, I've been, as I read more of Kant and try to make more sense of his theory, it strikes me that um, it's hard in some ways, to, you get a much better sense of what his ethical project is about if you pay attention to his empirical psychology. Um, and although there's a lot about his empirical psychology that I think is not right um, or um, off the wall, he also can be extraordinarily insightful, about, particularly about the way that human social relationships work. So I think there's a lot in Kant that's relevant to my interest in the relationship between social conventions and the moral project. Um, and I think he's got a lot of interesting insights. So this project is about self-deprecation, but it's also about certain kinds of Kantian norms, too. Okay. So we often find ourselves in situations where acts of self-deprecation seem socially obligatory or nearly so. Not a lot is going to rest on that notion of obligatoriness. Um, for instance, if I have just received a significant honor, been given a large compliment, or done something notable, there tends to be an implicit expectation that I offset it somehow. I might make a joke about how the honor was a big mistake, or remark on how terrible I am at other things, or um, or play down my own role in the accomplishment by talking about the contributions of others. Some such attempts at self-deprecation are more successful than others, but they're generally socially expected. We also often deprecate ourselves in response to someone else's mistake, gaffe, or embarrassing circumstances. So if my friend puts his foot in his mouth or shows up for an event inappropriately dressed, I might react by telling anecdotes about similarly awkward things that I have done. Self-deprecation in these cases may not exactly be required, but is recognizably do, good to do as a matter of social norms. In both types of cases, my act of self-deprecation functions to restore everyone to the same social level in response either to my own elevation or to somebody else's demotion. So as I said, I'm interested in the relationship between the requirements of etiquette or manners and the requirements of morality. My view is that at least some social norms and practices can be given a moral justification as well meaning that we're often morally required to act in accordance with social requirements. But self-deprecation is a complicated case. Obviously, it's a practice with considerable variation across cultures and social groups, but that's not my primary concern here. 
Rather, I plan to explore and defend the following two perhaps competing intuitions. This is on, um, the first part of the handout. Some acts of self-deprecation are not just socially obligatory, but also morally important. But other self-deprecating acts, while socially obligatory, are seriously morally troubling. For instance, let me give two examples. For instance, I think in the present state of things, there are moral reasons for women philosophers not to engage in self-deprecation at at least many conferences, even when such self-deprecation is socially called for. Likewise, I will argue that although social norms call for deprecating one's children on occasion, there are compelling moral reasons to resist. The philosophical aim of this paper is to give a moral basis for self-deprecation that can unify those two intuitions. Okay, so the two intuitions are that sometimes self-deprecation is a morally important thing to do, and sometimes it is not, and trying to figure out why that's the case. So my argument will rest on largely Kantian foundations. Kant is an obvious choice in some ways, since there are clear links between the practice of self-deprecation and self-respect, a topic on which Kant, of course, had much to say. In the cases in which self-deprecation seems morally problematic, there are fairly straightforward Kantian reasons why. Giving a Kantian argument in favor of self-deprecation is more of an uphill battle. There are a number of Kantian reasons not to engage in self-deprecation at all, and so it will take some work to show that those reasons do not always apply, and indeed that there are also Kantian reasons supporting self-deprecation in some circumstances. I hope that the task of offering a Kantian argument for that intuition will illuminate both the practice of self-deprecation and also certain interesting elements of Kant's ethics that are often overlooked. So before I begin the main argument, I want to offer a couple of caveats. First, I'm deliberately using the term self-deprecation in a morally neutral way. This is a departure from how the term is used in the very few articles that even mention the issue. But in that literature, it's more common to use self-deprecation to mean something akin to self-degradation, which seems to already imply that it's a morally bad thing to do. I think there's good reason, at least for my purposes, to keep the term neutral with regard to actions. Um, so on my view, a self-deprecating act is simply an act that consists in putting oneself down in some way. Now, one, oh, actually, some, some such acts will turn out to be degrading to oneself, but not all of them will. I should also note that this category of a self-deprecating act, and this is one of the points where I've realized this is just enormous, is a really hard one to pin down. Because there are a lot of things, and I'll come back to some of this when I talk about um, some of the ways it can go wrong, that can count as acts of self-deprecation. I mean, you can even actually sometimes say words that would be bragging if you said them in other words, but they can be self-deprecating. There's, there's ways of self-deprecating without using words at all. It's a really complicated topic. It's a hard one to pin down. Um, so I'm just going to, I'm glad to come back and talk about that in questions because I don't quite know what to make of that. But I'm really here just thinking of certain kinds of paradigmatic instances of self-deprecation, ones that we would recognize as self-deprecation, but realizing there are a lot of acts that don't fit that very smoothly. Um, so I'm going to focus on paradigmatic cases, but I'm not claiming to have provided any kind of unifying account of what makes something an act of self-deprecation because I don't know how to do that. Um, second, I'm focusing on particular acts of self-deprecation and not virtues with which self-deprecation is commonly and naturally associated, like modesty or humility. This is not because I think that they're unrelated. It's probably characteristic of modest people that they employ self-deprecation on a frequent basis. But I don't think that exploring the basis of modesty is especially helpful for figuring out what to say about self-deprecating acts. This is in part because, as Julia Driver has pointed out, modesty is a really peculiar virtue insofar as it seems to require ignorance of your own merits. So in her view, it's in order to be really modest, you have to sort of not really know what your own accomplishments are. So there's a lot of literature around this particular topic. Um, and if it's true that modesty requires ignorance of your merits, then it strikes me as a good reason to wonder whether it's a virtue. But setting that aside, my view is that the proper use of self-deprecation requires moral knowledge because it depends on the recognition of the moral equality of all members of the community. Self-deprecation that rests on genuine ignorance about one's own moral standing or that of others will turn out to be the self-deprecation that we should not practice. Besides, on my account, self-deprecating acts will fit just as naturally under a virtue like compassion as they do under modesty. So in the interest of time and clarity, I'm not going to discuss the relationship between self-deprecating acts and specific virtues, although if anyone wants to talk about it later, we certainly can. So this is how the paper will proceed. I'm going to start by with a brief account about what Kant thinks about moral equality in human community, its importance, and the difficulty of maintaining it. 
This is going to be the glue that holds together the pieces of my account of self-deprecation. I'll then turn to the comparatively easy task of setting out the Kantian argument against certain self-deprecating acts. These reasons rest primarily on our duties of self-respect, but our duties of respect to others will turn out to be important as well. Finally, I'll take on the rather more challenging task of showing why there are nevertheless also Kantian reasons to engage in self-deprecation, given a certain view about how human beings operate in the actual world. Self-deprecation, I will argue, functions as a crucial shield against the vices of hatred and the subsequent danger of misanthropy, which Kant thinks poses a serious threat to the human moral community. So basically, we need to self-deprecate because it prevents people from hating us and us from hating them. That's the short answer, and that matters. OK, so section two, Kant on moral equality. So one of the hallmarks of Kant's moral theory, indeed probably the hallmark, is his insistence on the absolute moral equality of all rational agents. The gradual unfolding of the categorical imperative in the groundwork makes this evident. In the universal law formulation, Kant sets out the rational necessity of recognizing the claims of others to pursue their ends with the same freedom I would grant to myself. The process of universalizing the maxim on which I propose to act is intended to help me determine whether my proposed action would count as making an exception for myself, acting in such a way that my success depends on others not following suit. Kant thinks that such maxims conflict with the rational requirement to regard others and their projects and plans as having moral importance equal to my own. Shortly thereafter, he reinforces the rationality of the commitment to equality in the humanity formulation. That formulation states that I must always treat humanity in myself and in others as an end in itself, conceived both negatively as an end not to be acted against and positively as a set of ends. The humanity formulation contains no distinction between how I regard myself as an end and how I regard others. We are all ends in virtue of having dignity, incommensurable and unconditional value. It matters tremendously to Kant's ethical framework that the source of my moral status is something I share with other rational agents. The collective acknowledgement of our equal moral standing corresponds to the ideal moral community Kant calls, in the final formulation of the categorical imperative, the kingdom of ends. Kant's highly abstract account of the categorical imperative in the groundwork is widely known. What is somewhat less widely known, which I think is unfortunate, is the extent to which he considers its application in the lives of rational beings who are also imperfect human beings. In various writings, he says a great deal about how we might lay that abstract moral framework of the groundwork onto the messy conditions of actual human life, the purview of what he calls practical anthropology. Much of what he says about human moral psychology may strike a modern reader as outdated or just wrong, but Kant also has some very keen insights about the, the way that human beings tend to operate and what that means for morality. There is, on Kant's view, a sizable gap between what we can and should be like and what we are in fact like. The ideal moral community described in the groundwork as a kingdom of ends is certainly not where we actually live, as Kant well knew. His view of human nature is a dark one in many ways. And yet the kingdom of ends is nevertheless an ideal that we are supposed to bring as close to reality as possible. Many of the duties spelled out in Kant's later ethical works are effectively tools that help us bridge the gap between actual human nature and the moral ideal represented in the categorical imperative. Kant did not himself think of self-deprecation as one of these tools, but I will argue that it makes sense to think of it that way, at least when used properly. Self-deprecation can bring flawed human relationships closer to the moral ideal, but it can also go badly wrong. Let me start there. Section 3, Kantian reasons against self-deprecation. So the Kantian demand that we see ourselves as the moral equals of others is generally expressed in terms of respect. We respect humanity in ourselves and others by refraining from treating any rational agent as a mere means and also by regarding all rational agents as setters of ends. So that's again, the end conceived negatively is not to treat people as a mere means, but there's more to treating someone as an end than that. You also have to regard them and yourself as a setter of ends, someone who's capable of setting ends and pursuing them. The duties that arise from the injunction not to treat rational agents as a mere means are more or less the same when applied to ourselves and when applied 
to others. So there's a great deal of symmetry between those. The kinds of things that I can't do to others in terms of perfect duties, like kill them and so forth, are the same reasons that I have not to do those things to myself. So for instance, Kant, as is well known, has an argument against suicide. I think it's actually one of the more compelling secular arguments against suicide that there is. And that argument basically rests on the idea the exact same reasons that make it wrong for you to kill somebody else apply to you as well. Um, and the ground is basically that each rational being has a kind of unconditional value. The value is not conditional on your valuing it. Likewise, Kant thinks your value is not conditional on your valuing your own life. Um, so those duties the, the duties, the duty not to treat yourself and others as a mere means, are more or less parallel when we're talking about ourselves or others. But that's not the case with the duties that, regard, that arise from regarding rational agents as setters of ends. And respecting myself as a setter of ends generates the imperfect duty to cultivate my own natural and moral perfection, but respecting others as setters of ends generates the imperfect duty to make their ends my own. So just to review, I'm not sure how, people, how familiar our people are with the structure of the doctrine of virtue, but basically the, the requirements of perfect duties, which are the ones that are the requirement not to treat humanity and ourselves and others as a mere means, um, those are generally, they don't have to be, but they almost all are, um, requirements of, of, sort of duties of non-interference in various kinds. We also have imperfect duties, which are duties to adopt maxims. And Kant says that there are two ends that are also duties, basically two broad imperfect duties that we have to take up. Um, one is to promote my own perfection, either natural or moral, and the other is the duty to make the ends of others my own. So there's, those are not symmetrical. I have no duty to promote my own happiness, and I have no duty to promote the moral or natural perfection of others. Okay. So in the lectures on ethics, Kant goes so far as to say that self-respect, understood as fulfilling my perfect and imperfect duties to myself, is in some sense prior to respect for others. So this is the first quote on the handout. Far from ranking lowest in the scale of precedence, our duties toward ourselves are of primary importance and should have pride of place. For it is obvious that nothing can be expected from a man who dishonors his own person. He who transgresses against himself loses his manliness and becomes incapable of doing his, doing his duty towards his fellows. It follows that the prior condition of our duty to others is our duty to ourselves. We can fulfill the former only insofar as we first fulfill the latter. The idea, I take it, is that if I do not fully appreciate the source of my own moral status in my own rational agency, I will not be capable of appreciating the same source of moral status of others. Right? So in this way, self-respect is necessary to get respect for others off the ground. So this is supposed to, ha supposed to be how it works, at least as I interpret it in the categorical imperative. It's only because I acknowledge my own standing as a rational agent and what that entails about what I sort of should be permitted to do and what others, how others should constrain themselves toward me. It's through recognizing that and then recognizing that other rational agents have the same status that the categorical imperative gets off the ground. That's basically what the universal law formulation makes us do. It sort of forces us to regard others as rational agents in the same way that I am. Um, Okay, so given this take on self-respect, it's not surprising that Kant warns repeatedly about the very human tendency to think of ourselves as being either above or below others. Kant thinks that we're much more likely to think of ourselves as being above others than below others, but both are going to turn out to be moral faults. In the lectures on ethics, he speaks against haughtiness, in which we put down, this is Kant's, these are Kant's words, put down the other and deem him lesser and lower than we are. He goes on to say of haughtiness that it Quote, it is not a presumption to worth and esteem in virtue of equality with others, but a pretension to a higher esteem and superior worth in respect of oneself and a lower estimation of other people. So the haughty person fails with regard to self-respect because she does not give for, full moral weight to the standing of others. She is thus engaged in a rational mistake of sorts, one that the categorical imperative is aimed at preventing. Servile people also fail to regard themselves as the moral equals of others, but in this case, the failing lies in thinking of themselves as being worth less than they are. In the doctrine of virtue, Kant lists servility as a failure of one's duty to oneself as a moral being insofar as it consists in relinquishing one's moral standing. As he puts it, self-respect requires us to be no man's lackey. Do not let others tre tread, not treat, tread with impunity on your rights. 
The servile person thinks too little of his own claims to count as fulfilling the injunction to regard himself as a rational being on an equal moral plane with others. As with haughtiness, servility blocks our ability to treat others in a fully respectful way. The haughty person elevates herself too far above others. The servile person elevates others too far above himself. Right? So for Kant, both haughtiness and servility are ways of going wrong with regard to self-respect. This looks a little Aristotelian. It's not quite, but it looks that way. Um, to, to have proper self-respect on Kant's view is to regard yourself as the moral equal of others. And if you regard yourself as being above them, you also have a self-respect problem. We don't tend to talk about it that way, but for Kant, it means that you don't really have self-respect in the way that he thinks about it. And if you lack self-respect, either because you're servile or because you're haughty, you're not going to be in a good position to, to appreciate the moral standing of others. So this is why Kant thinks that self-respect is prior to respect for others. It's not exactly that it's more important in the sense that you count for more, but there's a, it's a conceptual matter, and it's a conceptual matter with practical implications. I really am not going to get the source of other people's moral standings and the duties that I have toward them unless I understand the source, of, the source of my own agency, or the source of my own moral status in my agency. Okay, so the self-respecting person, true self-respect is between servility and haughtiness. The self-respecting person demands neither too little nor too much from others. And so the quote on the handout, which I think I'm actually not going to read, because um, I've more or less said that already, from the Doctrine of Virtue. Okay. So, oh, actually, no, I'm going to read the last line of this. Um, he can measure himself with every other being of this kind and value himself on a footing of equality with them. So it matters a great deal to Kant that we constantly recognize our standing as the moral equals of others. However, Kant is of two minds, though, when it comes to actually comparing ourselves with other human beings. He's sensitive to the many ways in which human beings are actually unequal to each other, not as moral unequals, but in other ways, and worries about the negative moral repercussions of such comparisons. I'll come back to that point in a minute. He also repeatedly reminds us that in comparison to the moral ideal represented in the person with a perfectly good will, we fail, fall pretty miserably short. But when it comes to comparing our own moral standing, rights, and claims with those of others, it matters to Kant that we end up thinking of all rational beings as equals. Insofar as either servility or haughtiness leads us away from that mindset, it poses problems for our moral relationships with others. So self-deprecation, it seems, is at least sometimes, surely, an expression of servility. And this is the sense in which when people use self-deprecation to mean self-degradation, that's usually what it means. Um, it can also, I think, importantly, serve as a cover for haughtiness or arrogance. So self-deprecation can sometimes be expressing servility or also expressing haughtiness. In neither instance, it doesn't serve the goals of morality. In the Doctrine of Virtue, Kant describes a phenomenon that he calls false humility, the practice of belittling one's own moral worth merely as a means to acquiring the favor of another, whoever it may be. So in the um, best-known discussion of Kantian servility, which is an article by Tom Hill um, on servility and self-respect, he distinguishes between two forms of servility. There's a servile person who really doesn't understand the basis of their own worth, so they really don't believe that they have the same moral standing of others, so it's kind of a mistake of ignorance. And then there's a second type of person, which might actually be worse, is someone who recognizes their moral equality but doesn't take it very seriously um, or doesn't think it's very important and is willing to subsume it to other kinds of ends. Um, false humility looks like the second kind of case, at least as Kant describes it, because in this case, what the person is doing, the person who is being falsely humble, if, if they're belittling their moral worth, if they're sort of lowering themselves so as to curry favor with somebody else or get a job or something like that, um, that kind of self-deprecation on Kant's view would be a way of sort of using your own moral status as a way of getting something else that you want. So it's using yourself in the same way that it would be using somebody else in a wrong way. So my favorite example of this, because I'm also a Jane Austen fan, is by Mr. Collins in Pride and Prejudice, if any of you know his character. Um, he's a good example of this. Um, he's always displaying very cringing, servile behavior because he wants to, to win the favor of his patroness. Um, and in doing this, on Kant's view, this would be a kind of lowering yourself, um, using your, lowering your, moral, your own moral status as a way of getting something that you want. And it's wrong on Kant's view for the same reason that it would be wrong to try to deprecate somebody else for the sake of getting something that you want. Right? Um, degrading myself to achieve, so this is it for Kant, this is using oneself as a mere means, an idea that has puzzled many. 
Kant's view is that degrading myself to achieve one of my own ends is wrong, and wrong in exactly the same way is degrading another to achieve my end. In both cases, I take rational agency and make it the servant of something less valuable. Now, people who are haughty in Kant's, Kant's sense may also employ self-deprecation as a way of reinforcing their elevated views of their own worth. We're all familiar with people who, confident of their own position, nevertheless engage in self-deprecation so as to have their remarks contradicted. The person who says that his house is a mess or that her last minute report is filled with flaws may know perfectly well that the house looks great and the report is brilliant. Such people take advantage of social norms about self-deprecation in order to produce confirmation of their own superior performance and hence of what they take to be their own elevated moral standing. So in practice, this is obviously really complicated. Sometimes when people are fishing for compliments, they're doing it because they're insecure. Sometimes it's some, there's a whole lot of things that people might be doing. And all I'm trying to do here is show that there are some cases where self-deprecating acts can reveal a problem about self-respect, either because they reveal that the person either doesn't understand their own moral worth or that they're willing to subsume it to something else, um, or it can also be a way of sort of showing off one's, what one takes to be one's own elevated status. Okay, so self-deprecation of either sort detracts from our collective progress toward the kingdom of ends insofar as it undermines moral equality. This is, on the Kantian account I've been developing, what's wrong with it? When self-deprecation interferes with our ability to regard ourselves and others as ends on an equal moral footing, it's a moral problem. Let me see, take, for instance, see how this plays out in the case of women in philosophy. And I use this example only because it's something that's sort of been bothering me lately. Um, I've been in a couple of conferences where I'm one of the only, this doesn't happen often in ethics, but it has lately, where I'm one of the only women in the room, and often one of the only um, sort of like tenured women faculty members in the room, and it just strikes me that then one is sort of in a position where it might matter whether one does this. Um, let's suppose that it's true, and I think there's evidence in favor of this, that women in general engage in self-deprecation more than men do. Whether or not this poses moral problems will depend on how self-deprecation is taken in those contexts. If it's likely to be interpreted as genuine inadequacy, then there may be reasons of self-respect not to engage in it. In a context in which I'm less likely to be regarded as a moral equal, self-deprecation may make the situation worse. In such cases, I should not do it, even if social norms point that way, or even if men would normally engage in it in those circumstances. But there's more to it than that, because I think in this case, um, the duty not to self-deprecate is not a duty that I owe just to myself, but also, and maybe primarily, to other women. In the doctrine of virtue, Kant separates our duties of virtues to others into duties of love and duties of respect. Duties of respect are owed to others in a way that duties of love are not. So the only duty which Kant really labels a duty is the duty not to hold others in contempt, which for Kant is a very central violation of respect. He admits that we can't help feeling contempt on occasion, but there's a strict duty not to show it. So basically you have to keep your contemptuous thoughts to yourself. Um, the duty not to be contemptuous in Kant is a really wide-ranging one. Um, so, among other things, it prohibits drawing and quartering people as a form of punishment, and it also requires that when, this is one of my favorite parts of Kant, that when we point out others' errors, we do so in a way that preserves that person's respect for his rational capacities. Right? So, if you correct somebody's errors in a way that makes them feel stupid, basically, Kant thinks you're holding them in contempt, and that's bad. Um, this is a good lesson for all of us in philosophy. Um, Oh, where am I? The other duties of respect, and this is I'm just spelling out how Kant describes the duties of respect, are described as vices rather than duties. I don't know why, um, and the difference doesn't matter much for my purposes. These vices include arrogance, defamation, and ridicule. Now, arrogance, as far as I can tell in the doctrine of virtue, is basically the same quality as haughtiness is in the lectures on ethics, so I'm just going to use those interchangeably. Um, even though they're different German words. Arrogance, as we have seen, is an attitude of superiority toward others that's incompatible with regarding them as moral equals. It's possible to show contempt without displaying the vice of arrogance, but contemptuous behavior is a hallmark of arrogance. Kant defines defamation, the second of the um, vices. These are on the handout, by the way, the vices. I've lost the second page of the handout. On the back. Defamation is the immediate inclination, this is Kant's definition, with no end in view, no particular end in view, to bring into the open something prejudicial to respect for others. I take this to be basically a duty against negative gossip, malicious gossip. 
Strikingly, Kant claims that there is not only a negative duty not to spread negative gossip, but also a positive duty to, this is a quote from Kant, throw the veil of love of man over their faults by keeping what we know to ourselves. The final duty of respect, the duty to avoid ridicule, is a duty to avoid wanton fault finding and mockery, or to make the faults and foibles of others a source of amusement for ourselves and others. Kant is careful to distinguish ridicule from teasing and joking, recognizing there's a point at which those harmless interactions cross the line into something more sinister. Okay, so duties to others that we have in the doctrine of virtue are um, duties of respect and duties of love. These are the duties of respect. I'm going to come back to duties of love. So the duties of respect are sort of taking up attitudes toward others that acknowledge their rational standing. The duty not to ridicule others is especially important for my purposes because it seems to suggest that there's a compelling moral reason not to deprecate others, whether because they have been elevated in some way or because some third party has slipped below the rest of us socially. If so, then there seems to be an important asymmetry between the norms of self-deprecation and the norms of deprecating others. And indeed, social requirements bear this out. It is one thing to joke about how an honor I have just received must have been a mistake, but it's another thing to joke about how Sam's honor was a mistake. Likewise, I cannot make fun of Joe's clumsiness as a way of enabling Jane to feel better about having just knocked all the party food onto the floor. And yet it does seem like I can make fun of my own clumsiness. For the most part, social norms that require self-deprecation do not require, and perhaps even forbid, deprecation of others instead. This is not easy to explain on the Kantian view, because the reasons that I have not to deprecate others are also reasons not to deprecate myself. If mocking or defaming someone is always a degradation of her moral standing, then it would seem that mocking or defaming myself is also always a degradation of my moral standing. If so, then if self-deprecation is ever permissible, it will be important to explain how it's possible to engage in it without degrading myself. I think that such an explanation is possible, that self-deprecation is importantly different from the deprecation of others, but I'll have to come back to that. But the fact that I can't permissibly deprecate others does explain why it might be morally troubling to accede to the social demand that I deprecate my children in circumstances where they have been elevated in some way, say by winning the school spelling bee or scoring the winning soccer goal on a magnificent play. Leaving aside any psychological ramifications for them if they hear me deprecating them, so assume they're not there, it seems that if I deprecate them in response to their achievements, I violate a duty of respect to them. Granted, it's not always easy to separate compliments about one's children from compliments about one's parenting and hence about oneself. If my children are being especially well behaved, I might reasonably take this to be my achievement. Actually, it wouldn't be reasonable because everyone knows you can't control how your children behave. Um, and hence something about which self-deprecation could be appropriate. One can also disclaim any credit for the child's achievement by making fun of one's own terrible spelling or complete lack of athletic ability. But responding to comments about the child's success by pointing out how bad she is at math um, or how terribly she plays basketball seems morally suspect, something that we can readily explain by pointing to Kant's duties of respect. Okay. Um, so what I'm trying to show you is there's pretty straightforward Kantian reasons against certain kinds of self-deprecation. They can sometimes be violations of self-respect. They can also sometimes be violations of, res of so there are reasons of self-respect sometimes not to deprecate myself where doing so would either express servility or haughtiness. And I also have reasons of respect for others not to deprecate them. Now what I want to say is that sometimes self-deprecating can violate a duty of respect toward others. So the fact that I owe others duties of respect also adds a new angle to what I have said is a moral argument against self-deprecation at a conference. When my act of self-deprecation clearly applies only to me, the primary considerations are those of self-respect. But of course, some kinds of self-deprecating acts implicate others. If, in response to winning a prize in a math contest, I self-deprecate with a joke about how amazing it is that any woman could have won such a prize given how bad girls are at mathematical thinking, then I am deprecating other women by extension. Whether this violates a duty of respect for those other women depends on whether the group is vulnerable to disrespect in that regard in the first place. If I instead deprecate the intelligence of philosophers, it does not have a particularly pernicious effect in communities where philosophers are generally regarded as extremely smart. 
in contexts where philosophers are regarded as weird, which is probably most of them, um, then it might have a different effect, right? But it has a, the, the point is that if a group is vulnerable to disrespect in that way, as obviously women are vulnerable to disrespect with regard to certain kinds of abilities, then my self-deprecation, if it deprecates other women by extension, is a moral problem because it increases or it, or it, let's say, it reinforces an attitude, an objectionable attitude toward those other women. But it doesn't have that same effect if I'm deprecating a group that's not vulnerable in that way, right? So you can crack jokes about philosophers being stupid in context where no one's actually going to think less of philosophers in that way. Right. So my deprecation of the group of philosophers um, as being stupid is not likely to re reduce the respect for the others as a group. However, deprecating myself as a woman philosopher, I think, would be a different story. Okay. So what I've said basically is there are reasons, moral reasons not to self-deprecate based on self-respect and respect for others. Okay. Um, now I want to turn to the question of what kinds of Kantian reasons there might be supporting self-deprecation, section three. No, section four, sorry. So one of the more striking differences between Kantian and Humean ethics, at least as I read them, is the very different assumptions about human moral psychology on which they rest. Of course, they take very different views about what motivates us to act, but that's not the difference I have in mind. Quite simply, Kant takes a much dimmer view of human nature than does Hume. Hume thinks that we're naturally inclined to be social, to take an interest in what happens to our fellow human beings, to feel pleasure and pain at the joys and sorrows of others. It's true that our feelings and interests are often partial and prejudiced, and so need to be corrected via the adoption of the general point of view. But for Hume, there's no fundamental difficulty about allowing morality to rest on the natural sympathies and propensities of human beings. And he doesn't think there's an alternative anyway. Human nature is capable of generating a decent moral community, even when left entirely up to its own devices. But this is not how Kant sees it, at least as I read him. If morality ends up somehow depending on the good tendencies of human nature, we are in big trouble. Kant's account of human nature varies somewhat, more than somewhat, across different works and over time, but in general, the picture he paints is a rather dismal one. Human beings are morally frail, prone to weakness, error, and sin, sometimes lapsing into wickedness, and constantly having to fend off the worst aspects of our nature. We find ourselves drawn into society, but it's very difficult for us to live in community with others. As Kant puts it, the human condition is marked by what he calls unsociable sociability. But at the same time, Kant's moral theory is marked by a pervasive optimism about the possibilities for human moral and political community. This is one of the traits that I find really endearing about Kant as a philosopher. As rational beings, we're capable of living up to a much higher standard of behavior than nature alone would indicate. It's true that we have a propensity toward radical evil, but it's something we're capable of resisting in favor of morality. Kant is realistic about the difficulties of developing a fully good will, as well as the difficulties of knowing how well we're succeeding in that task, given the opacity of human motivations. Kant thought we had very little insight into how our own motivations were working, much less those of other people. But he's committed to the idea that we can and must try, and that if we do, the possibilities are quite grand. The kingdom of ends is an ideal, but it is one we should be trying to instantiate so far as we can. Bringing about the kingdom of ends, however, is a big task, especially since in undertaking it, we are very often fighting human nature. So this is a point where I think there's a pretty significant difference with Hume. We must know the enemy, and the enemy is within. When one steps back and looks at the whole of Kant's writing on ethics, it is striking how much ink he spills on topics like malice, envy, grudge, spite, schadenfreude, and misanthropy of all forms. It is, on his view, often very hard not to think of other people as being worthless scum, but it's also very important that we don't. It's not that morality requires feelings of love. We can fulfill every moral duty in its absence, even the duties of love, but it's a daunting task. The more we can make ourselves love others, the more likely we are to succeed in the moral project. This is why anything that detracts from our efforts to love people counts as a vice for Kant. So Kant has often been criticized for his handling of the sympathetic philanthropist example in the groundwork. The sympathetic philanthropist helps people from love rather than duty. And Kant infamously says that such actions warrant praise and esteem, but they lack moral worth. Kant's supporters have launched a number of compelling defenses of his claim. Some have said that philanthropist's motives aren't connected up in the right way with the motive of duty. Others have said that the motive of love 
isn't sufficiently reliable. This last point makes sense on Kant's view of human nature. If the duty of beneficence, this is the duty to make the ends of others our own, or one of them, rests on actual feelings of love, then it will not prove to be much of a duty. It's important to Kant's account of beneficence that we have reason to help people regardless of how we feel about them. The grounding of the duty of beneficence is the other person's status as a setter of ends, the recognition of which demands respect from me. Whether, like the sympathetic philanthropist, I have feelings of love toward the person is really beside the point when it comes to the duty to make his or her ends my own. But this is not to say that love is irrelevant. Kant thinks, perhaps plausibly, perhaps not, that through acts of beneficence, we may come to have feelings of love for others. In the lectures on ethics, he puts it this way. This is on the handout. Well-wishing from love cannot be commanded, though well-wishing from obligation can. If, however, we do well by someone from duty, we get used to this, so that we subsequently do it from love and inclination as well. If we speak well of someone simply because we see that he deserves it, we get used to this, so that afterwards we intone his merits and everything. Thus, even love from inclination is a moral virtue, and might be commanded to this extent, that one should first practice well-doing as a duty, and later, through habituation, out of inclination as well. We do not need to love people before we have reason to help them, but if we help them, Kant thinks, we may well come to love them. Of course, we do often promote the ends of those we love precisely because we love them, but this is not the kind of love that Kant thinks it's our moral duty to cultivate, at least not directly. The love that we're obliged to show our fellow members of the moral community is practical love, what Kant calls practical, not pathological love. So pathological, roughly, Practical love is the actual helping of people, and pathological love are the feelings of love. That's oversimplifying a lot, but it's good enough for the moment. Pathological love tends to make practical love easier, which gives us reason to cultivate it. Right? So you don't need the duty of beneficence, the duties of love are duties of practical love. Right? And you have them whether or not you feel pathological love toward people. But Kant thinks that if you do them, you may, he says, seems to think you'll start to feel pathological love, which may or may not be true. But what he does also really point out is that it's a whole lot easier to fulfill those duties of love toward people toward whom you already feel pathological love. Practical love is possible in the absence of pathological love. But this, this is a good thing, because on Kant's view, we have duties of love toward people whom we find very hard to love. No doubt, this is why Kant takes so seriously the vices that tend to foster hatred, cynicism, and feelings of superiority over others attitudes that he thinks are unfortunately common among human beings. Hatred makes practical love extremely difficult. Besides the three vices that interfere with our duties of respect for others, arrogance, defamation, and ridicule, Kant also has three vices that he calls vices of hatred for men directly opposed to love of them. This is on the handout. These vices, this is his word, comprise the loathsome family of envy, ingratitude, and malice. They are vices because they make it harder for us to see others as worthy of love. But how can we love if the other is not worthy of it? The love in this case is not an inclination to have liking for another, but an inclination whereby the other would be worthy of our liking. We should be inclined to the wish of finding the other worthy of love. And anyone who seeks in the man something that would be worthy of love will also certainly find it there. Just as an unloved man who seeks in another for what makes him unworthy of love also actually discovers it in him. We should wish for the happiness of the other, but also wish to find him worthy of love. Kant thinks that the duties of respect toward others are primary, in part because he thinks that violating duties of respect towards someone sort of strikes more at the heart of rational agency than violating duties of love toward them. But one of the things that he also notes is that it's in some sense easier to fulfill the duties of respect toward people that you hate than it is to fulfill the duties of love toward people that you hate. It's a little bit easier. He may be wrong about this, right? but it's easier to avoid defaming or mocking people, um, to, to treat them respectfully in that sense, even when you hate them. I don't know if this is actually true or not, but that's what he thinks. Um, and it's not easy to find others worthy of love, both because of how they behave and because of our own nasty tendencies to look for ways to feel superior to others. For this reason, Kant worries about the practice of drawing comparisons between ourselves and others. When we compare ourselves to others, one of two things will happen, Kant thinks. This is a great piece. Um, I, I teach this to undergrads all the time. I use a section of Kant because they all identify with it, um, this discussion of comparison. 
Um, so if we come things, if we compare ourselves to others, one of two things is going to happen. Either we will come out looking superior, in which case we will grow smug or arrogant, or we will come out looking inferior, in which case we're likely to feel jealous and hateful. Neither attitude is very helpful in the difficult task of creating moral community. In an especially insightful passage, Kant remarks that parents should avoid setting up another child as an example for their own child to follow, on the grounds that doing so will only engender hostility and jealousy. So this quote um, on the handout. So when a mother says, look child, at young Fritz next door, how well behaved he is and how industrious, the boy at once takes a dislike to Fritz next door. This is what I mean about Kant, like being really insightful sometimes. Kant thinks we ought to restrict our comparisons to those in which we compare ourselves with the idea of perfection. We will inevitably fall short, but we won't turn resentful. Okay, so Kant thinks that there is really good reason to avoid deliberate comparisons between ourselves and other rational beings. We need to compare ourselves in the sense that we need to be able to recognize our own moral equality with people, but if we engage in the kind of comparisons that we do most of the times, it's going to create problems given what we're actually like. Um, but not all such comparisons are deliberately undertaken. Sometimes they're forced upon us by others, such as the mother in Kant's example, forcing that on her son, or by circumstances. We sometimes just find ourselves looking better or worse than others, and it's important that we attend to the repercussions. So Kant is acutely aware of how easily our sense of moral equality is disrupted in the course of ordinary human interactions. This is especially apparent in his discussion of the duty of beneficence. He notes that for the rich, acts of beneficence are only barely meritori meritorious. Often he thinks they're simply fulfilling the requirements of justice. This is not often known about Kant. He thinks an awful lot of what we call beneficence are actually duties of justice, um, and hardly deserving of such praise, of much praise. More to the point, he says that when a person confers a benefit on another, quote, he must carefully avoid any appearance of intending to bind the other by it. For if he showed that he wanted to put the other under an obligation, which always humbles the other in his own eyes, it would not be a true benefit that we rendered him. Instead, he must show that he himself is put under obligation by the other's acceptance, honored by it. Hence, the duty is merely something that he owes, unless, as is better, he can practice his beneficence in complete secrecy. So acts of beneficence on Kant's view are morally valuable. In fact, they're actually a moral duty. It's a duty of love to benefit others. But Kant recognizes, and this is one of the places where I think he's really insightful about the way this works in actual human life, he recognizes that they're also destabilizing because they put the recipient in a lower position than the benefactor. On Kant's view, being the recipient of a favor is an inherently humbling thing, and this poses problems for those all-important relationships of moral equality. Now, Kant may be wrong about the pervasiveness or seriousness of this effect of beneficence, but he surely does have a point about how beneficence can impede moral aims in the process of trying to achieve them. Right? So, as everybody knows, it's possible to undermine someone's project or self-respect in the course of trying to help them. In these cases, the loving benefactor, on Kant's view, employs tools such as anonymity, or casting the action as something she owes or would consider it a favor to do. And so this, think how often that we cast something, like if we do something for someone, I'm saying, oh, I like doing that kind of thing. I think that's fun. Um, we often cast it in such a way or portray it in such a way that it doesn't really look like a favor to someone. Doing this is a way of preserving the beneficiary's self-respect and, on Kant's view, helps her avoid the kind of resentment that beneficiaries may be prone to feel toward their benefactors. So this is one of the places where I think like, the, the, interesting, the, the interplay between empirical psychology and Kant's view and his ethics is really important. So the duties of love include beneficence, gratitude, and sympathy. Right? So we, grat beneficence is a duty of love. So is gratitude for things that people have done. But in fact, Kant thinks, when we try to put this onto real life, we get all kinds of problems. Because acts of beneficence can have the effect of lowering someone's self-esteem, and they can also generate resentment, which makes it harder for that other person to fulfill their duty of love of gratitude. Okay. So gratitude, so in this case, right, there, there are a lot of tools that people trying to fulfill those duties have to employ in order to make it work in the actual circumstances of human life, given our tendencies toward things like resentment, feelings of superiority, and inferiority. I propose that we think of self-deprecation as a tool along these lines, a tool for restoring moral equality when comparisons are thrust on us, 
much as anonymity is a tool for maintaining moral equality in the face of someone's need for help. If I'm elevated by my achievements, talents, honors, or the explicit comparisons of others, self-deprecation is a way of bringing me back down to the same level. Of course, my moral standing on Kant's view is not, in fact, elevated by what I have achieved or anything, right? Because we are all moral equals um, all the time. But it's hard for human beings on Kant's view to keep this front and center, given our tendencies to jealousy and resentment. Self-deprecation helps return our focus. The boy in Kant's example will dislike Fritz if his mother keeps comparing them, but there are things that Fritz can do to mitigate this effect. Self-deprecation is one of those things. Imagine if Fritz tells the boy that his mother is always asking why Fritz can't be like him. Problem effectively solved. Self-deprecation thus becomes a way of publicly affirming my commitment to regarding myself as the moral equal of others. If circumstances contrive to place me higher than others, I refuse to stay there. Likewise, if circumstances contrive to lower someone else's social position, self-deprecation can be an effective way of combating what Kant thinks are the inevitable negative effects. In this way, self-deprecation functions as a salve against the stings of inequality. It prevents other people from hating me, as they might be inclined to do, and it also helps them not hate themselves. And likewise, other people's self-deprecation helps me not hate them. Okay, so, conclusion, pulling it together. So my claim has been that self-deprecation, properly employed, patches tears in the fabric of moral community. It's a way of restoring moral equality in the face of circumstances that disrupt it. Okay? Or at least it can be, right? So self-deprecation can work in either of two ways. It can either undermine moral equality or it can restore moral equality. And obviously that corresponds to when it's good to do. As I've been presenting it, self-deprecation turns out to be the fulfillment of a duty of love and not a duty of respect. So my efforts to prevent someone from hating me or to block um, or, or to accept somebody else's effort for me not to hate them is a duty of love. As such, it's a wide duty and should normally give way to the much narrower duties of respect. So on Kant's view, duties of respect generally trump duties of love, not always, it's more complicated than that, but because duties of respect tend to be narrow, meaning there's less latitude about fulfilling them, and duties of love are wide. Um, so I can, this means that, so, so duties of love are trumped by duties of respect. This means that I cannot normally deprecate others at all, since that would be a violation of the duty to respect for them. Right? So if it would make person X feel better and be less resentful if I deprecate person Y. It might be true that I would make them feel better, but I can't deprecate person Y to make X feel better for the same reasons that I can't, following this old example, kill Y to take his organs to help X. Um, so self-deprecation, it also means that I can't deprecate myself in a servile way since that would violate my own self-respect. Self-deprecation may also conflict with other duties of love. Even if my self-deprecation at a conference wouldn't deprecate other women by extension, it might be a duty of love to others if I don't, if it helps them have more confidence in their views. So acts of self-deprecation are good to do, maybe even required, though I haven't argued for that, when they're done as a way of acknowledging moral equality between myself and others in circumstances that threaten that equality. They're bad to do in circumstances where they undermine that equality, either by reducing me below the level of others or reducing others by extension or by elevating me. Self-deprecation can thus turn us into what Kant calls a friend of man, one who takes an affective interest in the well-being of all men, rejoices with them, and will never disturb it without heartfelt regret. For a friend of man includes, as well, thought and consideration for the equality uh, among men. So a world in which we replace our natural tendencies toward hatred with feelings of love for our ration, fellow rational beings is, for Kant, a world that is ever closer to the kingdom of ends. And my claim has been that self-deprecation is a useful tool for bringing that about. Thank you. So we'll break for about five minutes. Okay. We have the back and, forth, and then we'll reconvene for a question period.
life actually is full of way more thirds, you know, the third thing you don't know about, or the third, the, the ignorance, ign just let's call it ignorance. Um, and that's why I think Hegel's right that, that the higher uh, the higher category is is forgiveness and not any of these tools per se, because actually, and, and that Kant is right that there's no example of the category comparative that we really can't. We can talk about these tools blue in the, in the face, and they're helpful, but they don't actually solve the, the fundamental problem of you know bizarre ignorance on so many fronts when we're trying to be helpful or you know self-deprecating in a helpful way. It seems very badly wrong. We don't know why because we don't know the rules of the game. So in other words, if we know rules of the game, we can be what you're suggesting. And, and to a certain extent, we do, but to a large extent, we so don't. And that leads to a lot of trauma and complications, in which case we just sort of have to be forgiving. So that would be my question. So that's really interesting. I mean, because one thing that would suggest is that we, it'd be really hard to know what self-deprecation is going to be a tool in doing in a given set of circumstances. So whether this is a case where self-deprecation would in fact prevent resentment and restore this moral equality, or whether this is a case where it would somehow make it worse in some way. And part of that is even exacerbated by the fact that there's so many ways in which one can self-deprecate with a bunch of different words and actions too. And so then there's that communication. Yeah. So. Um, so what I'm inclined to say, so this is one of the things that this brings to mind is that there do seem, back to the social conventions, there strike me as being a whole bunch of social conventions about self-deprecation when it's sort of called for. Um, and, and because I do think that there may be circumstances if one should pause and say, actually, no, even though it's socially called for, I should not self-deprecate here. Um, those conventions may give us some guide. Now, it doesn't mean that, that I mean, if Fritz has no idea why his, the kid next door hates him, it's never going to help. Um, but then, and they're, they're kids, that makes it complicated too. But if, um, but one can imagine that there are circumstances, if in fact the conventions are, are, are pointing, correctly pointing to places where these kinds of things tend to arise, then if the conventions are sort of well marked, they can serve as a bit of a guide. It, it's only going to be a partial guide because there's always going to be many circumstances in which um, those just aren't straightforwardly going to apply. And some of that's going to depend on knowledge of the other person. Um, but I wonder if the conventions might be, that might be actually additional reason to self-deprecate when the conventions call for it, assuming that the conventions effectively track the kinds of things that generate resentment. But they might not, because of course human psychology is way more complicated than that. Thank you. I have to okay. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll take five minutes.